Welcome ladies and gents, Chris Andre here. You can find me at Bet Boxing on Twitter, or of course you can subscribe to the channel. Let's talk boxing, lots to cover today. We'll start off with the expected return of Alexander Vozdik this weekend. He's up against the guy who's no great shakes in Jorge Daniel Miranda, a fighter with a record of 58-21-0. So nothing that you'd expect really in terms of an obstacle, but you'd expect Vozdik to have this sort of transitional phase because the last time he was in a boxing ring, he fell to the hands of the beast from the east, Artur Baturbiev, in a 10th round stoppage. It was a terrific fight and it was touch and go. Many people had Vozdik ahead at the time of the stoppage in the 10th round, so he showed his level. And prior to that fight, many people felt that the Olympic bronze medalist was the best light heavyweight in the world. After all, he'd stopped Adonis Stevenson on that fateful night. Prior to that, though, he'd also had a bunch of other good wins. He'd beaten the likes of Unieski Gonzalez, Isaac Chilemba, Tommy Carpensi, Najib Mohamedi. So this is a guy that had a CV, and he was looking the business. He was looking the real deal. And he really was an effective boxer a puncher olympic bronze medalist like we said so real amateur pedigree there but he also had 14 knockouts from his 17 victories so we're talking about a destructive boxer at that and many had expected that he would actually topple baturbiev at the time he lost that fight one elite fighter beats another no big deal on paper but Vozdik decided to retire now we don't know really whether this was due to mental scarring I guess you could say or whether he took some sort of physical abuse and he just didn't feel the same again who knows but he is planning this return and Steve Kim caught up with Vozdik and he asked him some questions and one of them being what was it that is bringing him back to the sport of boxing and Vozdik tells Steve that I lost a lot now he's talking about the war now i'm not sure whether he means in terms of property and whether he means you know financial losses and as a result he needs to gain them back but he goes on to say but also it's to fly the flag of my country and then after that steve kim shows exactly why i will rate him so highly as a sports journalist i really do believe if you're a young journalist trying to get into boxing you need to study steve because the sort of questions he asks are sneaky, and I mean that in the best possible way. I don't mean underhanded, but what I mean is that he disarms the person that he's interviewing with some really insightful probing questions. And as a result of that, the person being interviewed can give honest answers rather than getting his guard up. Steve asks this seemingly very basic question. Did you miss the sport? Did you miss training? Did you miss the grind? Now try and understand the insinuation of what it is that Steve's getting at here. If he was to say to him, so is the sole purpose the fact that you feel that you have lost things and you feel almost a duty to represent your country, Vozdik instantly would have got his guard up and he would have said, no, 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 I missed the sport. I want to get back into it. I want to pursue glory. I've got dreams because he wants to convince the world that they need to get on the Vozdik hype train, right? Instead, by asking that one seemingly innocent question, Vozdik is able to say, well, a little bit, a little bit. It wasn't anything mad, like I wasn't able to sleep at night, but you know, it was there, it was there. And when I'd see other guys come out from the locker room, I miss that feeling and things like that. So now I have to start to ask myself, is his heart in this? In other words, why is he returning to the sport? Does he want to become the king of the light heavyweight division? Or is it a sense of duty? He feels, look, I need to do something here to represent my country that's at war. And additionally, I've had a lot of financial losses. Now, when a lot of fighters come back from whatever losses, forget a war, it doesn't have to be a war. It could be that they're bankrupt. Whenever they come back to fight on for a purse for money, they're never really that same fighter. They don't really have the same hunger. And Steve Kim, being as great as he is, what does he go and ask after that? He asks, how do your family feel about this? Again, you see how Steve's probing to find out what's really driving Vosnik here. You know, your family supportive? If they're not supportive, if there's some level of uh, opposition to what he's trying to do, well, then that's another thing that takes your mind off the prize, so to speak. I know it's a movie, but let's quote Rocky Balboa when Adrian was in a coma, right? He didn't really get into seeking that glory until Adrian was hugely behind him. Where Adrian's lying in the hospital bed and she's finally ready to give Rocky her blessings and she ushers him in. She says, Rocky, there's only one thing I want you to do for me. Win. 
win. And then you've got Mickey in the background sounding like Popeye saying, what are we waiting for? Take us. And then the bells start ringing. And as a kid watching it, I start losing my mind. And I jump up and run over and try and punch one of my older cousins in the head. And obviously I end up getting whooped, right? But at the time, you're not thinking along those lines. You're thinking you're Rocky Balboa and you're ready to take on Apollo Creed, let alone one of your older cousins. But that's by the by, that's a whole other conversation. But back to Vosdick and his interview with Steve Kim. He says, my family are behind me and support me whatever I do. Now, that's not exactly a shining endorsement of what he wants to do. But nonetheless, fair enough, it's not an opposition. The point is, though, Steve's asking some fantastic questions here. And these questions alone, to me, they seem to suggest like he's getting into boxing for a duty. There's something to be earned financially and as though he has to represent his nation. I don't see the hunger there for this man to get back to the top of the sport. So what does Steve then go and ask him? Do you have a specific goal or are you merely waiting to see what happens this weekend and then see him from there? And what does Vosdick respond? He says, well, I do want to see how this weekend goes first. But yeah, I would like to fight the top guys, not these types of guys. Now to me, again, if you're starting to read between the lines, there's some concerning signals being given here from Vosdick. He's not saying, I want to avenge my loss against Baturbiev, or I want the belts. So if that means I go after Dimitri Bivol, then I go after Dimitri Bivol. I want to be a world champion again. That's not what he's saying. What he's saying is I don't want to fight this level of opposition. I want to fight the top guys again. Who are the top guys? Are we talking top 10 guys? Or are we talking the guys? If you're talking the guys, why aren't you mentioning them by name? Is it possible that maybe Vozdik is just trying to alleviate pressure from himself? He's almost trying to come from under the radar and uh, you know, start some sort of assault on the titles without really having that pressure on himself of too many people expecting something from him. But if that's the case, then he's looking to alleviate pressure. Even that, to me, seems like a sign of not being truly confident of what it is that you want. Does he have the mindset right now of a hunter? You see, if Alexander Vozdik is the guy who he once was, like I said, the first fight with Baturbiev was considered a pick -em, regardless of how that fight ended up. Now, Bivol, a lot of people are thinking he could potentially beat Baturbiev. There are a lot of other people that feel that Baturbiev would beat Bivol. Regardless of what order you have him in, they're one and two. Now, Vozdek having lost to Baturbiev, you definitely can't have him at number one. But there'll be people that will say, yeah, you know what? I think a prime Vozdek would actually beat Bivol. In other words, he's two or three, potentially, if he's the same guy. Now, it's a big if because he has been out for a long time. And there are these signals, in my opinion, which are concerning mentally. But this could really shake up the light heavyweight division. Let me know if you think I'm overanalyzing here. Let me know what you thought about that little interview with Steve Kim. You can find it on his Twitter channel. Now, moving on from that, No Smoke Sport have announced that a source of theirs has informed them that Chris Eubank Jr. will activate the rematch clause in order to face Liam Smith. The fight will either occur in Smith's hometown of Liverpool or it will occur in Manchester once again. And the date they're looking at is May the 27th. Now, I know a lot of people feel that Eubank should not take this rematch. If he loses again, many people feel as though his career is over. The thing is, if Eubank is going to carry on fighting, I personally believe from a tactical perspective, in terms of marketing and PR, this is the best approach he could take. I know a lot of people are saying, no, Chris, he should either move up. He's been struggling to make the weight and things like that. I know there are a whole bunch of other people too who may feel as though he should go for Conor Ben. After all, that is the fight where you've got the name recognition. It's still a massive fight that will capture the imagination. And some people could argue that now it would even become an, a bigger fight in some ways because initially there was this interpretation among many people that it was a real mismatch and that Conor Ben was a lamb being sent to the slaughter in order to make a lot of money for Matchroom. And they were almost cashing out with Conor Ben. But the thing is, having Eubank stopped by a smaller man will make a lot of people wonder whether Conor Ben, who's a banger it seems at welterweight, would be able to hurt him. Then again, you've also got the question mark about whether Ben's power will still be there because, of course, he has that illegal substance in his system. And I know there's a crowd out there that believe Conor Ben and believe that he's innocent, regardless of whether you think he intentionally took the substance or not. And like I've said, it would take something pretty extraordinary now to convince me that he's innocent. But let's just say for argument's sake, you're in the crowd that believes he is innocent and you are right. Fine. He may have been unknowingly ingesting something, but he still ingested it. In other words, the physical 
effects of taking that substance were there for him. And therefore, when you eradicate that substance, the psychological impact of knowing that whatever it was in your system improved your athletic performance. Now that you have to perform without it, it's almost like taking away a comfort blanket. It's almost like going to battle without a bulletproof vest, without body armor. Now you're concerned about being exposed. And so there's a psychological impact on Conor Ben as well here. And many people will look at that and they'll say, Eubank needs to strike while the iron's hot. He can catapult himself back into public consciousness with a devastating victory against a guy who's going to be proved to not really be all that without this synthetic boosting of his capabilities. So there are enough uncertainties there surrounding both guys which might make the fight more intriguing than ever potentially. However, the reason I still feel that he should go for Liam Smith is because Eubank Jr. was always a guy that had this aura about him where he viewed opponents with this air of contemptuous superiority. He looked down on his opponents. And we're not talking about losing valiantly on points in the way he did to George Groves or Billy Joe Saunders where there was a late onslaught from Eubank and he was really a warrior that kept plugging away towards the end, but he just lacked really the technical capabilities to overcome those guys. We're not talking about that sort of scenario. We're talking about him getting stopped brutally by a smaller guy. So in order to eradicate the demons of that, you need to put things right. And so he did, in my opinion, win all three rounds before the knockout. Most people I've come across seem to have given him two of the three. Regardless, people felt as though he was ahead. He needs to think about his nutrition, think about how he's making the weight, consider his training team, whether he wants to stick with Roy Jones Jr. or not. And in my opinion, he needs to try and right this wrong. Otherwise, he will be a tainted asset. Let me know what you think about that. If you were an advisor to Chris Eubank Jr., what would you advise that he should do next? Moving on from that, Eddie Hearn has put out a couple of messages on Instagram and on Twitter. One of them was a quote to say, kill them with success and bury them with a smile. And the other one was no pay-per-view, just a small taster of what's to come in 2023. Oh my dear. This comes alongside the news that DAZN are drastically upping their pricing for DAZN customers here in the UK. Now, as you guys are fully aware, we're always neutral in this channel. We always play the defense and the prosecution. So I am going to give you both sides of the argument. I'll give it to you from DAZN's perspective too, as we ask whether there's a DAZN shakedown going on of their customers right now. But I'm also going to give you an opinion as to why I don't think that this is a justified move by DAZN. Firstly, you've got three options in terms of picking a price plan. One of them is the current agreement you have with DAZN, whereby you have to give 30 days notice in order to cancel your subscription. This was only a new introduction, by the way. Initially, you could cancel at any point. Now they've said if you want to cancel, they can take an extra month from you, essentially. So you need to give them a month's notice. Going up from $7.99 a month to $19.99 a month. This is a huge, huge jump. However, there are ways around this. If you go for the monthly saver approach, you'll still be paying monthly, but you'll be signed up for a year. It'll be a year's contract, like a mobile phone contract. You will be paying $9.99 a month. So it's only a couple of pounds in terms of the increase of what you are paying now. However, they're also offering you an annual super saver, whereby you can pay $19.99 up front. Now that means that you give up the 1999 from now and for the next 12 months you will have access to the zone. You simply pay it in one lump sum and that works out to about £8.25 per month. So whatever happens, you're going up in price. Now, they're quite sly in claiming that with the money saver option, you can save £120, and with the annual super saver, you can save £139.89. No, 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 DAZN. Let's not get it twisted here. You're only saving that compared to the flexible pass. Prior to that, in terms of what I'm paying now, I'm not saving that amount, am I? I'm paying you more, DAZN. If you are used to buying a cup of coffee for four pounds and then your favorite coffee shop tells you well we're up in the price now to six pounds but if you buy in bulk in advance it's only going to cost you five pounds you're not saving a pound you're spending an extra pound right so this is a bit of a, an attempt to pull the wool over the eyes of the consumer here however 
in terms of trying to look at it from the perspective of the zone, they're talking about there being no pay-per-view, as we said. Well, that's not strictly true, because if you are paying at nineteen ninety nine, if you are paying the flexible pass, you're essentially paying the price of a UK pay-per-view, at least the price of what it used to be up until not that long ago, a few months ago, a year ago, every single month. Now, you have to ask yourself whether the zone will be putting out the type of coverage that is suitable for a pay-per-view every single month. The zone schedule for 2023 from this point forth has been doing the rounds and there are some good fights there, no doubt. Wood Lara, you've got Joshua Franklin, Bam Rodriguez Gonzalez, Taylor Serrano 2, Rakimov Cordina. So there are some good fights there. There are some good cards there, no doubt. The question is, does this warrant the price hike? A lot of people feel as though the quality of the content has declined and yet the price has increased and you have to ask yourself whether the box nation sort of um schedules that we were seeing were worse than this because you were paying 10 pounds a month for that but you had some fantastic content and you have to say the content was a lot better than this in terms of the fights you were getting so is this really a case of the zone changing the game now we're going to be honest like i said we like to play the defense and the prosecution and i guess a counter argument could be that one of the reasons they're doing this is that if they're able to get your money ahead of time they're able to make investments and they're able to get a return on those investments so if you want to see superior cards moving forward they need the sort of capital that will come in first before they can make the fights in order to convince you to buy the zone so it could just be a tactical ploy and from this point forth you're still going to get a really good schedule it could be a much better schedule than what you're seeing here and as a result the quality of the content will improve however the problem is that there's no guarantee of this and so whilst they're going to lock you into a year's worth of a contract what happens if after may the content isn't great or what happens if after may any additional fights that come let's say they throw anthony joshua versus dillian white which might capture the imagination of the british public what if that's a pay-per-view and you have to pay on top of what you're already paying? Let's not forget, they did it with Can Canelo Golovkin, right? They wanted to introduce an additional pay-per-view packet on top of what people were paying. So it's not like they're averse to doing this sort of thing. So if they do do that, then you're paying an awful lot more than the supposed £99 a year. So you could end up paying for a schedule you don't want. And for the actual fights you really want to see they're actually going to cost you additionally to that and i'm already seeing an awful lot of people who had defended the zone who have been saying i'm out at this point so let me know what you think is this going to harm the zone or do you see it as a tactical approach which will enable them to provide better content down the line let me know what your position is on that and everything we've spoken about here today please don't forget to hit a stiff jab on the like button a right cross on the subscribe button and an uppercut on the notifications button thanks for watching everyone chat to you soon take care god bless